Empire of Ashes by Nicholas Macastro Chapter 21 Notice, gentlemen, that unlike Ascanes, I did not tell you he died on that occasion. To be sure, Alexander very nearly did succumb to poison, as my opponent has told you. By the fourth day of his illness, matters were desperate. What Ascanes does not know is that, in fact, the efforts of the king's Babylonian doctors met with complete success. Now that I see, I have your attention, and though I know I am racing the clock, I will try to tell you the real circumstances of Alexander's death. Thanks to the arts of the Babylonians, the king's fever broke within two days. Before the end of the week, he was able to hold down his food. As it happened, then this incident seemed like yet another of the king's victories over mortality. Rumors spread that Alexander had rallied. The world, having held its breath, took ease at last. On orders of the king, however, no official announcement was made of his recovery. While it seemed odd that he wanted to withhold this information, I presumed he wished only to test the loyalty of those satraps who might revolt. On this, as on several other matters that day, I was wrong. For Alexander was not pleased with his recovery. Instead of launching himself into fresh plans for building or conquest, he sat with a dejected look on his face. No one, not his friends, his new wives, nor Bagoas, could rouse him. As for me, he tolerated my presence in the room, but would not speak. When he looked at me, it was with accusation in his eyes, as if I had been responsible for the undue extension of his life. Rogain gave the entirely appropriate reaction to his improvement. For the very first time, she had followed my directives on dress and comportment to the letter, looking very much like the dutiful Greek wife. My lord, I rejoice at your recovery, she exclaimed, approaching to give him a kiss. But Alexander turned his face away from her. She soldiered on, smacking him on the cheek, going on about the growth of the child within her. Alexander was silent, regarding her coldly. He only seemed to relent when she held up a piece of woven cloth for him to see. I've had Utab begin the swaddling clothes for our son. I've made her swear to finish before he comes. The king's brow softened a bit as he looked at this naive bit of handiwork. He was filled, no doubt, with that ambivalence particular to new fathers, as yet unsure they are up to the demands of the role. In Alexander's case, the uncertainty must have been deeper still, convinced as he was that his wife had a hand in his poisoning. And yet, while she carried his heir, there was nothing he could do about it. Knowing Rogaine, I am also sure that everything she did in that meeting was contrived to remind him of this fact. If I may serve you in any way, please call me. If I call for anything, he finally said, it will not be for the water you brought. Do you remember? I remember. Good. And do you remember Hephaestion too? Of course, she said, keeping up her denial. Who could forget such a noble captain? Very well, he replied, waving her away. After she was gone, the king grew tired and slept for three hours 
in the middle of the afternoon. When he woke up, he called for all his personal companions to attend him. Perdiccas was there, and Ptolemy, Inertus, Eumenes, and myself, pulling himself to a sitting position. The king asked a strange question. Eumenes, is Hermolus still with us? You mean Hermolus, son of Sopolis? The page? Yes, he lives, though in what condition I cannot. Good, bring him. And so I learned that Hermolus, the main instigator of the page's plot against the king's life, had not been executed yet. It was a peculiarity of the Macedonians. I saw that certain important prisoners were not killed right away, but imprisoned for as long as it took to wear down their defiance. For particularly stubborn characters, this process might take years. There were still rumors about the camp that Callisthenes was not dead, but languishing in some hole until he earned a kiss with his prostration. Only then would he be allowed to die. None of us had seen Hermolus for some years. In his confinement, he had grown into a man, albeit a thin, pale, unkempt one, so unused to daylight that he could not keep his eyes open. He was naked as he was brought in, bearded to his breastbone, shackled by his feet. Do you know where you are, boy? Alexander asked. By the stench of oppression, I would say I am before Alexander. It is the stink of sickness you smell, and your own rot. Rot, sickness, tyranny, all the same. Alexander laughed. A clever answer from a ghost. What a man you might have become, O oh, Hermolus. Now, peevish retorts are all you have left. Or are they? The page's eyes cracked open a bit. The Alexander I once loved did not waste time with riddles. The king rose to his feet, stretched his arms, and grimaced in pain from the Malian wound. Fair enough. The day of execution is at hand. Eumenes, bring his arms. Meet me under the east wall, near the Marduk gate. Hermolus, once during the hunt, you stole the boar from me. I give you an opportunity now for the biggest game of all. Don't disappoint me. With that, the king left. The rest of us, including Hermolus, stood dumbfounded. Perdiccas came out of it first. You heard him. Arms for the prisoner. Alexander waited for Homolus. Alexander waited for Hermolus outside the murdered gate. He had only his chamberlain with him. On his back and legs he wore the cuirass and greaves of divine Achilles. He left the ancient sword leaning against the pitch-clad bricks and the great gorgon's head shielded next to it still marked from the ordeal at Moltan. As we all met there, it seemed we were all on stage, with the scene lit only by torches, set in the atrical backdrop of the Babylonian wall. Like distant stagehands, the tiny helmeted heads of two guards looked down on us from hundreds of feet above. They were as it was, the only other audience for the night's drama, still in shackles. Hermolus had a peaked Phrygian helmet with the cheek guards down, a leather corslet, and a hoplite shield. He was standing straighter now, his eyes wide open, but he still had the look of a man who expected at any moment 
to wake up from his dream. Alexander took up Achilles' shield. Give him a javelin, he ordered. If the king permits it, we might execute the prisoner in the usual fashion, suggested Perdiccas. Alexander answered with these verses from the twenty-second book of the poem. The running is over, Achilles, and no more. Three times around the city of Priam I ran, unable to face your assault. But courage anew, I feel in my heart, to face what must be faced. As you all may recognize it, is Hector's last challenge to Achilles, before their duel at the walls of Troy. And though I had heard him quote the poet before, this was the first time he had cast himself not as his ancestor, Achilles, the swift runner, but as Hector, a breaker of horses. Ptolemy gave Hermolus a javelin. The latter looked at Alexander, then the weapon, holding it in front of him, as if he'd never seen one before. Do you expect me to kill you with this? I expect you, replied the king, to accomplish what you swore with your comrades. There was a time when you stood before me and called me a tyrant. Well now, here I am, boy. Strike me down. Fix my arrogance. I promise, no one will stop you. Perdiccas looked to Ptolemy, who looked to me in amazement. It was the first time I had seen either man in such dire confusion. I suppose they would have said the same of me. Hermolus shrugged, seized the javelin with an overhand grip, and cocked it above his head. Then he sang, You beyond forgiveness should not speak of pact. Can there be deals between men and beasts? Between wolf and sheep, there is no common ground, born as they are to live in undying hatred. So it is between us, no love lost, no peace, until you or I may stripe the dust and sate Ares, shielded scourge of men with our blood. Come to me, then, with what courage you have left, death or victory. Show me your skill, as a daring man of war. He made his throw. The javelin flew from his hand, the st and straight for Alexander's head, only to lodge in the soft brick of the wall. The king had ducked. Missed, have you? Now look at the divine Achilles, so sure you were that Zeus decreed my death. You were bluster only, trying to strike fear in me, make my legs shake, loose my nerve. And so the king, taking his turn, lofted his spear with the same unerring skill that had killed Clytus. Alexander made a dead center shot. This time, however, his opponent was armed with more than a drinking cup. The metal tip bounced off Hermolus's shield, leaving only a small dimple in the surface. I see you have no spear in reserve, said the king. Only this sword, replied the other. As do I. They closed on each other with blades unsheathed. Alexander seemed to be moving at half speed, not yet at full strength after his illness. Hermolus, likewise, had done of his former quickness, having spent much of his youth in a cell. Yet the slowness with which the duel unfolded only made it seem more terrible as we could all anticipate and feel every blow. Alexander was on the attack, striking at his opponent as he grasped his wounded side. Hermolus parried, backed up, counterattacked. The king stumbled and fell, his sword clanking to the dirt beside him. Perdiccas moved to intercede, but Ta Ptolemy held him back. It had not taken long 
for the latter to realize how he could benefit from these incomprehensible events. Hermelus, perhaps overwhelmed by the prospect that briefly opened before him, did not kill Alexander right then. Instead, the king had time to take his sword again and ward off the final blow, as Hermelus lost his balance. Alexander tried to get to his feet, but froze with the torment of his malleant wound, his face and neck contorted with the agony of it. In that second, with Alexander's hesitation, Hermelus saw his chance. He put the point of his sword right through the cleft at the king's throat, just above the top of Achilles' cuirass. The blade cut with appalling ease through the soft flesh, exposing the white surface of his windpipe. Then the blood rose and covered everything. The windpipe, the blade, the hand that held the blade, the ground. Defendant, stop speaking, said the judge. You have run out of time. Chapter 22 Makan stood with his mouth open. The water had stopped. For a professional speaker to be interrupted like this would be very bad form. The jurors were left hanging just at the moment of Alexander's death. Yet Swallow didn't think this blunder would count too much against Makan. He was, after all, an acknowledged amateur defending himself against one of the most formidable orators. To show his inexperience was to make himself sympathetic, for if there was anything Athenian jurors hated more than a bad show in the courtroom, it was a career litigant. McCann sat down. At that point in the procedure, there was an unofficial recess as the magistrates conferred and the clock was reset. The jurors stretched their legs, and although any sort of discussion or politicking was forbidden before the verdict was read, deliberation was already under way by other means. Experienced jurors could always gauge sentiments by exchanging glances with the men around him. Arguments could be joined by raising an eyebrow and resolved by a downward flicking of the eyes. A swallow looked at Deuteros, who concerned with a nod. Swallow looked at Deuteros, who concurred with a nod. Matters were not looking good for Ascanese. Though it came only near the end of Makan's testimony, and was only one incident in Alexander's eventful life. The pardon of Cleomenes finally seemed to turn most of the jury against Ascanese and the appeasement faction. The parties will have one measure of time each for disputation. Prosecution, do you wish to ask questions of the defendant or make a statement? Ascanes didn't answer, but simply manifested, bright-robed and full-throated from his seat. Athenians, we meet on a sad day, for what we have heard from the defendant represents a challenge to all of us who believe in the truth. Where to begin to unravel this Gordian knot? The defendant has spun for us. To be sure, the events that I have narrated, and Makan has distorted, took place years ago and far away, and are already passing from the veil of living memory. Yet I say that their passing should not be an occasion for self-serving revision. 
I say that what the mass of observers believe to be true should be should command respect and the subjectivities of certain others less so no matter how well placed they may have been i say that something happened in the past and those happenings stand as facts regardless of insinuation or anecdote for my part i am not afraid to tell you that i take these proceedings seriously i spent a considerable time preparing my presentation which was gleaned from the reminiscences of numerous witnesses based on those testimonies i learned much about my subject and i must tell you that the alexander i came to know in no way resembles the person macon has described according to the defendant the lord of all asia was a little more than a quarreling querulous child he was afraid of the future afraid of his enemy and afraid of battle imagine that alexander afraid of battle macon tries to exploit unkind rumors about alexander's friendships with men to portray him as some kind of womanly chimera we would all reject anyone's claims to know what the king of hephaestion did in private and it is nothing less than rank slander to claim as macon does that alexander let himself be used like a common prostitute for that outrage alone he deserves conviction perhaps macon thinks so little of us as to think we can be fooled by his strategy to defend himself he must try to pull down Alexander. What a curious defense to deny his impiety by denying the god. And meanwhile, he insults all Greeks with his malicious recollections of Alexander's doubts. Could a man full of doubt have led an army for twelve years against the largest, most populous empire the world has ever seen? How does a general in constant fear of assassination so inspire a general in constant fear of assassination so inspire his men as to leave behind an unparalleled legacy of peace and esteem could a mere drunk simply fall onto the throne of the great king as he maligns alexander macon slanders the characters of his most trusted lieutenants Paradicus and Ptolemy are made out to be craven opportunists who plotted and schemed for their own benefit while Alexander still lived. Craterus and Clytus are, in Macon's own words, thugs. Hephaestion was somehow reviled by everyone, though every scrap of evidence attests to the admiration he inspired in all men. How fortunate you for you, Macon, that these men are not here to make you answer for your lies. In these proceedings, we must be content to note that events since the king's death do not bear out Macon's version. It is not true, for instance, that Perdiccas or Ptolemy seized authority upon Alexander's passing. Perdiccas, by all accounts, was most reluctant to pick up the king's ring, and now rules by consent only as regent to Rogane's infant son and half-wit, Eridaeus. Ptolemy did not claim the throne at all, most obviously because his rank did not merit it, and also because he is a man of unimpeachable integrity. He is only the governor of Egypt now, and not her king. How Macon can profess to know that Ptolemy has intentions to be Pharaoh is beyond my understanding. Distortions of this kind, at least, have the virtue of referring to actual persons, and therefore having some root in reality. Tales of massacres of non-existent people, such as the Brachidae, deserve a no refutation. That Alexander died in a fight with Hermolus is accepted by no one, nor should we be detained 
by Macon's claims that it was Eridaeus, not Alexander, who generated or who generaled the victories of the Greeks. Macon presents no evidence to support this contemptible assertion for one simple reason. It is nonsense. I myself glimpsed Eridaeus during an embassy to Pella some years ago. I assume my impression of him still holds. He is a fool, completely unable to care for himself, much less command an army. That a man may somehow be a drooling idiot at one instance, and a dashing strategist at another, is absurd. There is no such thing as a half-time half-wit. The felicity of this phrase earned Ascanese murmurs of assent. He seemed to absorb this encouragement and magnify it, becoming still more compelling as he went on. Though Macon is an uncommon liar, he cannot help but ensnare himself as any liar must. A note that several times in his narrative he esteems himself as a skilled warrior. Yet, in his account at Cheronea, he clearly states that he was in the sixth rank of a phalanx eight shields deep. As we all know, veterans are never placed in the middle of the phalanx. They are either in front to inspire the rest of their valor, or in the last rank to prevent cowards from fleeing. So, which is it, Macon? Are you not such a doughty fighter, after all, that you were stuck in the middle? Or was your account of the battle a fiction, after all? See how he sits there, having sought so vainly to disrupt me before. All these matters distract us from the real issue. To my mind, these are and always have been the specific charges against Macon, that he violated his oath to the assembly, and that he showed impiety. That he failed in his service is proven by his own testimony. By his own admission, he was in charge of the managing Rogaine. Yet, he also suggests that the woman had a hand in Phasian's death. Once a poisoner, always a poisoner, I have argued myself that this same person slipped the fatal dose to Alexander. So, on this count, the effect of Macon's work was far less than negligible. His gentle instruction was the very incubator of her crimes. Regarding his other claims of service, such as repelling a Malian raid on the king's tent, no one else corroborates his story. Yet he admits that he tried to twist Alexander's mind in an effort to help him. What arrogance! As if anything poor Macon would have to say would affect the fate the gods had in store for noble Alexander. It is interesting, though, that Macon admits wishing for the king's death, and therefore the failing of Greek arms during the invasion of India. By the gods, what sort of patriotism is that? It must, I must address the issue of the alleged letter to the governor of Egypt. Gentlemen of the jury, I will not stand here and claim that Cleomenes was a virtuous man, or that he did not deserve the end he found under Ptolemy. He was indeed rapacious, grasping, despicable, any adjective you choose. But to claim that he alone caused the famine in Attica is to engage an irresponsible exaggeration, for the truth is that the shortages began as early as the arch archonship of Aristophanes, which was almost exactly the time Cleomenes was first appointed tax collector. 
So, unless we are prepared to believe that this man sees control of the grain trade instantaneously, it cannot be true that he caused the famine. Ships carrying grain from the Black Sea were sailed through a war zone. During those years, anyone may go down to Piraeus and talk to the captains there, who will speak of massive disruptions in this trade. Again, I excuse nothing that Cleonomies agreed that Cleonomies's greed may have worsened the crisis deserves our contempt. But that is a far different proposition than suggesting Alexander turned a blind eye to crimes that caused hunger in Greece. The letter Macon bandies about, therefore, is a transparent forgery. That Eumenes would even share such a letter, if it had indeed come from Alexander, beggars belief. Macon's impiety requires no proof from me, for it festers in the open, in every word that he utters. It lies not only in his contempt for Alexander and his lack of respect for the beliefs of his elders and his inordinate fascination with the ravings of Zoroastrians, Brahmins, and other aliens. It lies not only in his contempt for Alexander and his lack of respect for the beliefs of his elders and his inordinate fascination with the ravings of Zoroastrians, Brahmins, and other aliens. You may hear it in the way he speaks of Macedon, where great Olympus stands as if it were foreign territory, or in his eloquence when he describes the charms of notorious courtesans. This last we possibly excuse, as his mother was a whore. But what we cannot excuse is his mendacity. Athenians, for his is the type of thinking that has always placed our city in danger. His affinity for ambiguities of his own making, his championing of the weaker argument over the stronger, these are the legacies of men like Macon. Hearing his testimony, is it any surprise that strumpets, pacifism, and sophistry have become our leading exports? For this reason, for his presumption, for his failure, indeed for every reason in the world, I ask you to take the only just course. Conviction. Only with that may we begin to redeem the damage he has caused to all of us. For the final time, Ascanes brought his statement to a close, just as his time expired. Deuterus nudged his friend, and Swallow nodded in response. Ascanes had made a strong response to Macon, and had been clever in linking the defendant to that class of professional obfuscators who had been in ill repute since Athens had first lost her empire. True, only yokels still believed the agora to be crawling with sophists. Philosophy had run out its string, having long since been domesticated, professionalized, and packaged for the consumption of rich men's sons. Yet nobody was ever disappointed who counted on the votes of ignoramuses. It was hard to tell now which advocate had the advantage. It was beyond dispute that Macon had an interest in blackening Alexander's name, and as the orator said, men don't just fall into such fabulous success. Yet, Ascanes could not allay concerns over the pardon of Cle 
Omnis quite so easily. Claims of forgery were easy to make and could not erase a few simple facts. Before Alexander, no hunger. After Alexander, hunger. If it wasn't by his encouragement of Cleomenes, Alexander had to be responsible for the famine in some other way. Swallow looked at the sky through the window. Daylight was fading. More than for the fate of Macon, he feared he would lose his sleeping spot by the shrine of the trial, if the trial went on much longer. With a shudder, he realized he might even be forced to go home to sleep with his wife. Polycleitus indicated to Macon that it was his turn. The defendant took his feet with none of Ascanes Elan. Instead, he seemed exhausted. I must tell you that I was not expecting to have to speak again. Never in my life have I had to keep my mouth running for so long. Really, Ascanes, I have new respect for those in your profession. In war, we try to have it, have at it, and in war, we try to have at it and settle the issues as quickly as possible. In the courts, I see it is the longest-winded set of lungs that carries the day. Before I rest, I must tell you a few more things. First, although Ascanese tries to put the best face on it, he cannot excuse Alexander's letter to Cleomenes. The argument that Cleomenes was not so bad because he only aggravated your misery is just too subtle for a simple soldier like me to understand. Alexander did not just pardon the man's past crimes, though that is bad enough. He also forgave in advance any others he would see fit to commit in the future. It therefore follows that if Cleomenes did take it upon himself to starve the Greeks at some time later, that would have been fine with Alexander. I say this without taking any satisfaction in it. Had he lived beyond his grief, the king himself would probably have regretted his action. Didn't he always regret the awful things he did? As it was, the letter was written and delivered and the offer was never rescinded. These are the facts. Nor does the mere assertion that the letter is forgery necessarily make it so. The clerk has the original, the originals of other letters the king sent to Athenians. I invite the clerk to make a comparison of the documents. Does the seal match? Is the style comparable? I have nothing at all to lose from giving back my time for this purpose. The clerk just sat staring, doing nothing, while Polycletus glanced at the clock. I see the magistrates are late for dinner, so I will not insist. And so, on to my second point, which is this. I do not now bear, nor have I ever born any ill will toward Alexander. To say that I try to save my skin by harming his reputation is nothing but a handy supposition by my accuser. Against Ascanese's word, I have almost twelve years of continuous service, which is a long time to serve under someone one supposedly hates. The truth is, the very opposite of what my opponent says, as time passed, I grew to esteem Alexander more, for no man had ever faced the challenges he did to conquer an empire, to become the target of universal flattery, envy, and hope. These would try the sanctity of any man. For suffering these assaults, who can despise him? I could not have done half as well as he. Indeed, if I truly wanted to disparage Alexander, 
I could do no better than to repeat the stories that have persisted here in Athens. I could have said he was nothing but a brat, a drunk, a barbarian, a sodomite, a lunatic, or best of all, an illusion. For at one time or another, I have heard it claimed that Alexander died at the Granicus, Isis, Gogamela, and Multan, and that the Macedonians had concealed this truth from the world for their own purposes. I have also heard that he is alive right now in this city preparing to succeed where Xerxes failed by annexing Attica to his mongrel empire. Beside these rumors, my tale is tame stuff. Nor have I criticized him for the edict that raised the most protest in all the years he lived. I'm talking about his decree to all the cities of the Corinthian League that they must take back their exiles. That this measure was a selfish one on Alexander's part is beyond question. Asia was full of banished citizens from all the Greek cities, many all too eager to hire themselves out as mercenaries. Darius employed many. Aegis of Sparta got his hands on no less than 8,000 of them for his revolt in the Peloponnese, for the stability of his empire. This pool of dangerous labor had to be dried up. His reasoning has done nothing to make the order popular among the landed classes here. Naturally, many of them have become comfortable on the estates of their exiled rivals. But I am here to defend myself, not the interest of the 500 bushelmen of Attica or the Samian colonies. If you have lost your farm to a returnee, or being forced to tolerate the presence of a political rival, or of the man who killed your ox, or diverted the water from your stream, perhaps you will find sympathy with me. But I count on nothing. It's my own fault that I did not leave a time enough to complete my account of Alexander's death. As it was, I did not see him when he was most ill. So there's not much for me to add to that sad succession of a bad omens and sickness. I did have access to Rujain, though, and offer the following incident, if only to show that I have told you all that I know. It was on the third night of Alexander's illness that Rogaine, who had become an insomniac since the onset of her pregnancy, heard someone walking through the royal apartments. She rose, and seeing that it was the king, followed him on a circuitous route through the building. At last he came to a back door of the palace. Puzzled, she called to her husband, "'My king!' Can that be you? May we celebrate your recovery? The sound of her voice startled him. Drawing up his exhausted self, he replied in a voice so dry, it testified to every mouthful of dust in every desert he had ever crossed. You would do better not to interfere. Interfere in what? she asked barbarians and sycophants. How can you understand? My lord, let me help you. You may help me by allowing me the end my father expects of me. Instead, you delay me at the last minute with your foolishness. If I delay you, I do so only for the sake of your people and your son, who you would Never meet. My son would thank me for my disappearance. By this time, their conversation had roused the servants, who gathered around them in collective 
incomprehension. The king, knowing he had missed his chance to escape, allowed himself to be carried to bed. If this story is true, and I see no profit for Rogain in fabricating it, then it suggests Alexander accepted that his tent, his end, If this story is true, and I see no profit for Rogain in fabricating it, then it suggests Alexander accepted that his end was near, instead of making a spectacle of his mortal end. He plans simply to vanish into the desert. And no doubt such a disappearance would have served his legend well, like that of a god on loan to mankind, and making his return to heaven. I cannot believe, though, that it was the exit he most wanted. He preferred the taste of metal on his tongue, as an arrow shattered in his throat. The fatal fall from a speeding horse on a rutted field. Any death in action would have been better than some second-rate apotheosis, this stealing away in the dead of night from a bed of stinking nightclothes, taking a knife from a skulking assassin like his father, would not have been much better. At last, with the help of Hermolus, he found a better way. We all went to him as he fell. The wound in his throat did not penetrate his voice box but it was still painful for him to speak. Asked to whom he left his throne, he breathed to the strongest. We swooned in disbelief as he faded. This was, after all, Alexander, encased, moreover, in the armor of matchless Achilles. It seemed impossible that he could die so splendidly, armed until I remembered Hector's death. He was also wearing the armor of Achilles, having stripped it from the dead body of Patroclus. Most of you would probably not accept my story without further evidence. This was exactly the thinking of Perdiccas and Ptolemy when they sought to cover up the manner of the king's death. Hermolus, of course, was executed straightway. The two witnesses on the top of the wall were likewise ordered down and killed. I would have joined them, except that I still had a use as recorder of Alexander's greatness, and would not be believed anyway if I tried to spread the baseless story that he died in a duel with a minor prisoner. The story went out that he died of sickness. The response of his men was no surprise, given that Alexander had killed many of them, had tried the patience of the rest, and had driven them all as ruthlessly as he drove himself. The survivors mourned him out of genuine respect, yet also embraced each other, out of relief that he was finally gone, as if they had collectively survived some great storm. The Persians grieved too. In their case it was less in their esteem for him than because they were about to exchange the known sins of Alexander for those of someone unknown. Their uncertainty has still not ended, even to this day, as it also hangs over us. Ascanes asks how I know the characters of men like Perdiccas and Ptolemy. I must say I find his case laughable, for as he questions the experience I report after years in their company, he bases his whole prosecution on the written heresy of absent witnesses.
I must say I find his case laughable, for as he questions the experience I report after years in their company, he bases his whole prosecution on the written hearsay of absent witnesses. Ascanese, don't insult these gentlemen by overstating your case. Fine turns of phrase cannot hide your ignorance. If you had been there, for instance, you would know that the head injury Aridaeus received at the Hydapses has done him some positive good, that he talks more, has taken up the wearing of clothes, and all in all seems ready to reign in his brother's place. It only serves the purpose of Peridicus, that fine fellow, to keep Aridaeus from ruling outright. From the sound of the water, it seems I have a little more time, so I will help you to understand the man you have come to judge today. Ascanes says, I lack zeal for the Greek cause. He is wrong. I have fought for that cause all my life, in ways and to extremes far beyond mere talk. I was not only at Chironea, but carried a spear against Philip on the island of Euboea, and Acarnanian Argos, and Cardia, in the Chersonis, and in Thrace. This was while our friend, Ascanes, took his sin sinecure on sunny roads. And when I was sent to Alexander to fight for him, and the fates abruptly decreed that the nature of my help must change, I did my best though I knew little of diplomacy or of educating barbarous females. Never once have I said that if the Athenians wanted the skills of a diplomat or tutor, they should not have sent a soldier. I wonder if Ascanes had been there, would he have done better? Certainly his skills have served the Macedonians well in the past, but I don't think his golden throat would have done him much good against the Malian raiders that morning on the Hydapses. It is in your hands to determine whether I will take part in the coming fight with Antipater. For my part, I hope never to pick up a weapon again. A man can see enough war to understand that is, it is an exception opportunity for the triumph of mediocrities, mediocre men who ordinarily stand tongue-tied on the days, who fight half-heartedly for their city, who make affordable sacrifices to the gods instead of genuine ones, can, with the benefit of arms, snuff brilliant minds, rape graceful women, destroy the greatest art, murder children. Mediocrity always triumphs, no matter how lofty the ideal by which we begin, no matter how great the leader. Neither great evil nor great virtue can be around all the time, can see everything, yet mediocrity flies on horseback all over the battlefield, shouting, On to Pella, boys! It is living it up right now on native labor, on the estates owned by Greek barons in Sogdia and Bactria. Foundations crumble, fame fades, all hail the middling, so ubiquitous and eternal. The defendant took a seat with water still running through the clock. Polyclitus let it flow for a few awkward moments, as the courtroom absorbed Macon's strange outburst. To swallow this incoherence was the inevitable result of an unschooled speaker forced to defend himself beyond his means.
After all, this was no Demosthenes, who had shared the floor with Ascanes all day. Where Makan had begun his trial, with a face of polished calm, he finished with his manner perturbed, his voice trembling. Whether the jury read his attitude is presumptuous, or as the outrage of a man unjustly accused might figure, yet in the verdict, the jury will note, will vote, pronounced the archon. Then leaning forward, with his voice full of significance, he added, the city expects you all to fulfill your oaths. Two boxes were set out in front of the dais. Each juror had been issued two bronze discs, one disc with a hole in the center, signifying a vote of guilty, and one without a hole. The votes went into the first box, the discards into the second. As each man filled up to deliver his token, he was obliged to conceal his choice by putting thumb and forefinger over the center of the discs. The Scythian bailiffs were watching, lest anyone try to influence the verdict by speaking or by bandying his token uncovered. To defeat this, jurors over the years had hit on a simple convention. Votes for conviction were dropped in the box with the left hand, ones for acquittal with the right. When the ploy became too well known, the magistrates decreed that tokens would always be handed with the right hand. The jurors answered with a variation if voting guilty. The center of the disc was covered with thumb and forefinger, if not guilty with thumb and middle finger. So far, the authorities had devised no response to this. The first vote was on the charge that the defendant had violated his oath. The citizens came up by rows with Swallow and Deuteros among the first. Swallow delivered his token by thumb and middle finger, as did his friend. As the box filled with votes, the sound each bronze made as it hit the bottom, passed from a wooden thud to a bright clink. Ascanes sat with his back straight and his legs together, looking more anxious than at any point in the trial. Macon slouched, his ankles crossed ahead of him as he looked out the window. The vote seemed to be closely divided. When the next to last row filed out, the rube who had brought livestock to the courtroom, finally woke up, rubbing his head. He turned to Polycletus. Magistrate, I appear to have fallen asleep. Where is my lamb? The archon signaled to a bailiff who shoved the man toward the total, the tally boxes. The archon signaled to a bailiff who shoved the man to ward the tally boxes. Bewildered, the hayseed collected his tokens and went forward. Though he couldn't have heard a word of either presentation, Swallow watched when he dropped his disc. He used his thumb and all four fingers to handle the token, and so his vote was a mystery. The last vote was cast. The clerk and his assistant emptied the box and began to count as another set of tokens was handed out to each juror. The voting began on the second charge, in piety as the counting for the first proceeded. Swallow watched with curiosity as the clerk finished the tally, frowned, and decided they should count again. Because of this, the jurors sat for an unusually long time, as their stomachs growled and the full moon dipped into view through the windows. At last, the clerk handed Polycletus a lead tablet with the count 
for both charges. The Archon looked to the clerk as if to assure himself of the numbers. The clerk tossed his head in the affirmative. Polycletus faced Macon. The defendant will stand. Chapter 23 Macon hauled himself to his feet. With the possible exception of the Archon, he appeared to be the most dejected man in the room. Regarding the first charge, failure to fulfill his oath to the assembly, the jury finds the defendant Macon, son of Agathon, not guilty. The voters, the votes are 251 to 249. The room erupted as the jurors turned on each other. Accusations were met with counter-accusations. Hands raised in denial, fingers jabbed in every chest. Deuteros was almost pushed off his bench as a juror leapt to his feet behind him, screaming that the vote had been fixed. Another raised his arms toward heaven, beseechingly crying, May the gods protect us from the fury of the Macedonians. Soon the bailiff's truncheons were swinging, men were hitting the floor, and two citizens dueled with knives. It took some time before order was restored. Swallow was silent throughout the riot. In fact, this was only the second most even tally he had seen in his time. Macon was acquitted by a margin of two. Five years earlier, Swallow participated in a corruption trial that ended 251 to 250 with the tie-breaking vote for conviction cast by the Archon. Whatever we do, we must talk to the shepherd, he told Deuteros. On the matter of the second charge of impiety, Polycletus announced at last, the jury finds the defendant not guilty. The votes are 309 to 191. Clerk released the jurors. The 500 poured out in the alley in front of the courthouse. The jurors were each clutching their jury pay seven newly minted obols in their hands. Despite the lateness of the hour, a number of vendors on the agora on the agora stayed open for business. Despite the lateness of the hour, a number of vendors on the Agora stayed open for business. A man went around selling fresh water from a spigoted skin on his back. Another hawked flatbread from an oily sack, while a handful of women of various ages haunted the half-shadows around the crowd, murmuring to whomever was nearby. Some of the jurors went off right away to taverns specializing in the law court trade. The rest surrounded the bewildered Macon, pounding him on the shoulders, pumping his hand, begging to drink with him. Tell us, were those your own words? Someone asked. Did Demosthenes write the speech? Demosthenes, Macon replied would not have been so inept. Has anybody seen Ascanese? Gone through the back door, I think, with his reputation after so many trials to be so thoroughly beaten by an amateur. Searching the mob, Swallow caught sight of the shepherd. Someone had left his lamb tied to a stake outside the courthouse. The man had already spent some time of his pay on water for the sick thing. Swallow poked the man with his walking stick as the lamb lapped the water from the cupped palms. Friend, tell us, did you hear anything of the case? Can't see, as it's any business of yours, friend. Swallow tossed an obol on the ground. The other looked at the coin, gathered it under himself with his foot. 
In case you didn't see, I was out the entire day. So how did you vote? Silence. Swallow showed him another coin. Are you sure you want to pay him again? asked Deuteros. There's another case to be tried tomorrow, and the day after that. For now, I must know his answer. The lamb, having finished its drink, the shepherd dried his hands on a ragged tunic. I would love to take your money, he said, but no one explained the rules to me. I can't remember which token I dropped. I can't remember at all. Chapter 24 After his acquittal, Macon was seen carousing with well-wishers. Such good business followed him that the tavern stayed open until dawn. The barkeep had a pretty daughter who poured out the jugs and kept the roast eel and pork wound coming in a way that made everyone forget the privation of the trial. Swallow and Deuteros found the party soon after it started, the former buying the jurors several rounds of Thasian black from some seemingly inexhaustible source of silver. So where do you keep all that cash? Swallow, that you can treat us all so generously. So where do you keep all that cash? Swallow, that you can treat us all so generously. You don't want to know where he keeps his money, warned Deuteros. From the fact that you are here, asked another juror, may we suppose that you were in accord with the final verdict? Swallow smiled. If you knew me personally, my friend, you would not suppose that at all. But in this case, you are right. I had something to do with the happiness of this occasion. But did you have a verdict in mind when you came into the courtroom? Or was it something Macon said that convinced you? Again, Swallow found himself obliged to make some meaning of what they had heard that day. This time, however, the defendant himself was among those staring at him, confronted with the question of what verdict he originally favored. He glanced to Deuteros, who was engrossed in skimming the sediment from his wine to the edge of his cup. I will not lie to you, knowing the nature of the charges and the stakes of the trial. Deuteros and I came to court today intending to vote guilty. In this, we had only in mind the necessity of giving the Macedonians no excuse to attack the city. Of the wisdom of this view, we shall all learn in the near future, in any case, the credit for forcing me to look more deeply into the questions at hand, into the problem Alexander presented to us all, belongs to Macon alone. It was nothing in particular that he said. Instead, he convinced me that the fate of men like him and the fate of the city are not distinguishable. Athens is men like Macon. Drinks were raised all round, and murmurs made in solemn agreement. Macon's cup stayed up longer than anyone's, though as he stared into the fleshy crevices that contained the eyes of Swallow, the latter, feeling some modesty, was in order, then took to emulating Deuteros' fascination with the debris in his wine. But what of Alexander himself? Now that you have heard what Ascanese has said, and then Macon, which do you think better captured the truth of the man? Swallow frowned. If I foolishly profess to know the answer to that question, I would scarcely deserve the puzzling interest you all share in my view. Oh, come now, groaned the juror. Though we know you only in the courtroom, 
that you have an opinion about everything is public knowledge. Fair enough. If you want to hear me say something of him, though it can only be part of the truth and something of a truism, here it is. In times such as these, when everything seems diminished, the Greeks yearn for the straightforward heroism of Achilles. To his credit, Alexander tried to fulfill that need, but not even Achilles could provide himself with a worthy enemy to overcome and seal his fame. That is, instead, a gift of fortune. Alexander was not so lucky. He was forced to march through half the world to find his Hector. This foolish lionizing of Darius, of Porus, of dead competitors like Cyrus and Xerxes is evidence of his failure. If events had not intervened, he'd still be looking today, I wager. At this, no one raised a cup, and Macon kept his eyes on the table. This response, far more than their previous eager agreement, compelled Swallow to go on. But if you want to hear something, I do know for certain, he said. Understand this. The Macedonians will never accept a court verdict with which they so strongly disagree. It is not in their experience. Swallow directed this warning at Macon. The latter, however, made no other response but to lead his entourage through the rest of the Chian wines, and then the lesbian. They had moved on to a local vintage when someone began to sing the paean the soldiers gave before Chironia. At this, Macon's eyes filled with tears, and he joined in the singing three times over until his voice gave out. Worn down after his day of speechifying, the singing done, the party smashed their drinking cups against the wall. The taverner smiled, added the cost of the cups to their bill, and ordered up another amphora from the basement. Idling outside were the two Macedonians who had watched the trial from the spectators' gallery. Another man was with them, but stayed in the shadows. As grey light filled the eastern sky, they looked up to the Acropolis to see the night lamps snuffed out on the Propylaea. When the drinkers staggered out of the tavern at last, they lofted burrowed torches above their heads. The Macedonians stayed out of sight as they pointed out the figure of Makan to their hatchet-faced companion. He nodded, then stayed behind as the Macedonians disappeared into the warren of the Karamakos. Decent lodging houses were not common in the center of Athens. There was one good place near the law courts run by the Corinthian medic. It was beyond the west end of the painted stoa, just a little way toward the Dipilon gate. A man of Macan's importance would only be found there. The leader of the assassins was moving up in the world. It would be his first job for the Macedonians, as Macan was reputed to be a tough old soldier and hatchet face was by the large risk averse. He invented, he invited a pair of friends with him to do the deed. The freelancers were of the kind of common hooligan usually seen on the roads out of town. They had all killed people before, though this was most often a side effect of a stealing, a good overcloak or a pair of lace-up boots, and three of them agreed to show up dressed the same way. Wide-brimmed hats pulled down close to their eyes, tunics covered with leather butcher's aprons. 
If they timed their escape well enough, they would exit through the tannery quarter, just as the market day began. By then, almost everyone would be wearing a bloody apron. No one stopped them at the door of the lodging house, expecting that Macon would be in one of the better rooms, away from the street. They proceeded down the hall, with their knives still sheathed. As they approached the last door on the corridor, they heard someone chanting in an unfamiliar language. That room, no doubt, housed a foreigner. They knocked instead at the room adjacent, taking out their blades and holding them behind their backs. A man opened the door. He was young, no more than twenty, with rouged cheeks and a dressing gown that hung off one shoulder. Yes, he asked. We want to talk to Macon, said Hatchet Face. Who? He pushed his way past the boy. Inside a figure was cowering under a blanket. Hatchet Face signaled his men to surround the couch. Drawing the blanket aside with the point of his dagger, he found the boy's terrified, gray-bearded patron. The old man lay there, pale and trembling. He looked up without saying anything, his breathing becoming more audible each time he exhaled. Macon? Not Macon. Just then Hatchet Face realized that the chanting in the next room had stopped. Cursing his luck, he led his men to the next door. Finding it locked, they forced it off its flimsy hinges. What they saw inside brought them up short. The room was redolent of perfume. Peering into the smoke, they saw a small, round brazier with its flame still burning. Hatchet Face came in and looked down on the table where the fire danced. Beside the brazier was a dish of ground spice that looked like frankincense and fine twigs stripped of bark. This stick smells like apricot, one of the hirelings, a dispossessed farmer said. And this one is pistachio. Hatchet face made a perfunctory search of the place, but it was obvious that their quarry was gone. The window curtain was pushed aside. There was no sign of a heavy cloak. So Macon must have taken that with him. He came back to the table, noticing for the first time that there was a rag of pure white cotton lying on the floor. He picked it up. The rag had two strings attached to it, as if it was meant to be tied around the face or the neck. What is all this? I don't know, said Hatchet Face. Get a sack for the spice. After bagging the frankincense and stripping anything else of worth in the room, the assassins stored their loot under their aprons. With their knives hidden and hats pulled down on their faces, they slipped away. Macan's abandoned little clay amulet of the winged disc, his symbol of Ahura Mazda, they left behind as worthless. His thanksgiving fire was left to burn itself out. Authors Afterward In this betrayal of Alexander and his world, I have attempted to remain faithful to the better-known facts. These facts, however, don't always address the most interesting questions about the, his extraordinary life. His historical, fabulous, tend to be attracted to the lacunae and the mysteries of their subjects, where the truth may be lost, forgotten, or suppressed. It has therefore been necessary at times to aim not for the literal truth, but for the ring of it. A number of the events in Alexander's life have therefore been deliberately relocated in time and place. Many of these elements have bases in fact, but have been 
fleshed out beyond the rather telegraphic versions reported by the ancient sources. Others did not, in fact, happen at all, but should have. Certain events, such as the siege of Ornos, were left out because the themes they illustrate are adequately covered elsewhere. Readers hungering for the full story, as far as it is known, are encouraged to consult the original sources or scholarly biographies. In addition to the ancient texts, the histories of Arian, Curtius Rufus, and Plutarch, Xenophon's Anabasis, the forensic speeches of Demosthenes and Ascanes, accounts of legal proceedings in Lysias, Antiphon, and Apollodorus, numerous tidbits of ancient knowledge from Herodotus, Athenaeus, Strabo, Diodorus, Pliny, etc., all. A number of modern sources were useful in researching this story. These included, but were not limited to, Alexander monographs by Robin Lane Fox, Mary Renault, and Michael Wood, the treatments of ancient Greek life, such as those by Robert Flessel Leary, via Peter Green's translation, Robert Garland, Sarah Pomeroy, and James Davidson, whose delectable courtesans and fish cakes is much recommended. Whatever is accurate about my portrayal of the Zoroastrians should be credited to Mary Boyce's scholarship. Whatever is inaccurate is my fault. The works of J.K. Anderson and Victor Davis Hanson were invaluable for envisioning infantry battle in the 4th century. Early modern accounts of travel in the Near East, such as Charles Mason's 1842 narrative of various journeys in Balochistan, Afghanistan, and Punjab, were helpful in envisioning Alexander's route as it was in ancient times. Profuse thanks as well to Professor Ionis Akamatis of the Aristotelian University in Thessaloniki for an enlightening afternoon at his excavations in Pella and to Professor David Hollander of Iowa State University for his feedback on the manuscript. Some may be interested to know what really happened to Athens after Alexander died. In fact, the anti-Macedonian faction, powered by the indefatigable Demosthenes, did rouse the city to resist the Macedonian regent in Greece, Antipater. The result was a bitter affair called the Lamian War. Things went well for Athens at first, having at last found capable leaders who had fully absorbed the lessons of Chironea. The Athenians and their allies compelled the formerly undefeated Macedonians to retreat. The regent holed themselves up in the city of Lamia and faced being overrun there until some of Alexander's veterans from the Persian War returned to break the siege. The Greeks fought on, defeating the Macedonians yet again, until Antipater brought them to battle for the last time near the Thessalian city of Cranon. The immediate result was the Macedonians owned the field, though the Allied army was still not destroyed. What finally ended the revolt was the age-old Greek problem, failure to hang together in the face of common adversary. Demoralized, facing an enemy that was unchallenged at sea and getting stronger on land, the Greek allies melted away. At that moment, for all practical purposes, 
Athens ceased to exist as an independent power. The book suffers from its share of blunders, but just as all who wander are not lost, not all inaccuracies are mistakes. Pyrrhus may object, for instance, that I oversimplify the state of Athenian politics in many ways, including my making the historical Ascanese 390 circa 314 BC into an undisguised Macedonian apologist. The most relevant question here, though, is whether the man was capable of playing the toady if it suited his purpose. The answer is yes. Readers of Forensic Bent will note that the court procedure described here does not resemble current practice. Indeed, moderns first encountering the courtroom literature of classical Athens are often surprised that rumor, hearsay, irrelevancies, and character assassination were rampant in the incubator of Western rationalism. Orators had common recourse to insults, such as during a public prosecution of Timarchus in 346, when Ascanes accused the defendant's political sponsor, Demosthenes, of favoring girlish underwear. In the popular court, I describe the Heliae. What? I refuse to pronounce this. I remember this word. Anyway, I'm just going to spell it out for you. You can do with it what you will. Man, what a transliteration. Um, Demosthenes of favoring girlish underwear. In the popular court, I describe the H-E-L-I-A-I-A -I -A standards of evidence, discovery, and examination of witnesses were all strikingly casual. Helia, ia, whatever. When the, <laughs> when the prosecution and the defense had finished their statements, jurors were indeed called upon to render their judgment immediately with no deliberation of po politicking. Okay, now I'm. <laughs> or. <laughs> of politicking aloud. When the prosecution and the defense had finished their statements, the jurors were indeed called upon to render their judgment immediately with no deliberation or politicking allowed. While I cannot claim that every detail of this procedure I describe, describe is accurate, I must be getting tired, for much is unknown, it is likely that the Athenians of the time would have recognized the procedure depicted here as typical of their courts. Could there be any truth to Macan's story of Aridaeus as the secret weapon of the Met Macedonians? Though it is known that Alexander's half-brother was present on the march, the sources are notably silent on what, if anything, he did during the entire twelve years of the Asian campaign. My guess is that he impinged on events more than the official historians acknowledge. The precise nature of his mental deficiency would of course be nice to know. This side of the story, unfortunately, may never be recoverable, given the substantially different developmental environment that existed in antiquity it is not altogether clear to me that the kinds of illness seen then for the kinds of sanity for that matter are exactly the same as the ones observed among modern people the truth about Aridaeus may be far stranger than the autism I suggest for him here from the structure of the novel it should be clear that I see little profit in attempting to find the real Alexander. Alexander has been a perennially popular subject 
for classical scholarship, yet his study suffers from the fact that the man himself left relatively scant direct evidence for archaeology to uncover about him. A new developments in our understanding of Alexander is largely restricted to re readings and rereadings of the ancient texts, all of which are secondary, late, and ideologically driven in one way or another. Those looking for the key to Alexander's fall will likewise be disappointed. To my mind, what stopped him is not as interesting as what kept him going. While Alexander clearly relished building and administering things, it was the opiate of conquest, of taming the new, that came to dominate his short life. One can only imagine what he might have accomplished had he engaged his other talents. Authorities will long debate the significance of the achievements ascribed to Alexander, including his military innovations, the founding of Alexandria, the spread of Greek culture over a vast area, the model of divine kingship he bequeathed to Hellenistic, Roman, and later rulers, dreams of a trans-ethnic empire, etc. Perhaps the most unappreciated implication of his career, however, was the realization dawning somewhere deep in the ancient mind that such mythic accomplishments need not be the works of a god at all, but of the ingenuity, persistence, and vision of a flawed human being. In this sense, the story is a modern one.